the host. For a menu of available commands, press star pound. Okay, now you should be able to hear me. Okay. Helps when I turn the audio on. We are recording, so the uh, program will be up later on in case you uh, want to go back and review. Uh, I've got all your microphones on. If you want to talk, you certainly may. If you don't, uh, that's fine too. Uh, when we get to questions, uh, that's probably a good way to do it, or we can you can type it in on the chat if you prefer going that way. Um, I'm Mike Hershey. I'm uh, at the University of Illinois, and I'll be uh, doing the Soil and Water Fundamentals Review, plus uh, a couple of other ones. Uh, Gloria, you, I just got a big flash on my screen that said you were raising your hand. Okay. That's fine. I'm just trying to make sure I'm paying attention. Um, what we're going to do tonight, for about the next 90 minutes or so, depending on how many questions we have, is work on making sure everybody's comfortable with the basic concepts that you're going to need on the soil and water questions that you might run into on the exam. Um, Many of you emphasized off-road equipment or power machinery, so the, some of the soil and water stuff may not be familiar to you. Others of you might have been soil and water when you came through a, an ABE program, um, so that this will be mainly review. What I want to do is make sure that we at least expose you to the concepts so that when you are looking at a, pro a problem, at least you know the terminology so that you can go out and uh, dig into a textbook and find it. Or alternatively, if you've got tabs on your test textbooks, which is one thing I'd recommend, and we'll talk through some of that here in a minute, uh, that you can go straight to it and know uh, know what uh, you have to take a look at. So let me make sure I've got things working here. Uh, I want to acknowledge the folks that have done some of this in the past, uh, because uh, you know I've borrowed through the years uh, materials from other presenters. And I know uh, Dr. Motar is doing one of the presentations this year, um, but I'm not sure the other ones named are doing uh, too much of it this year. So I um, want to make sure they get credit for a lot of the hard work they've done through the past. Here's the topics we're going to take a good look at tonight. Um, the core principles of fluids, uh, because those it, understanding the background and knowing some of the assumptions uh, will go a long way in helping you deal with uh, stuff you might not be familiar with, especially if we can get just just get you comfortable with the units and some of the nomenclature. You got a fighting chance of knowing what's going on. Um, some basics in the soil and water area, and we'll talk about soil erosion principles and water quality principles. And all of this is setting you up for the other two or three soil and water seminars. Uh, I'll be given two more in the next couple, I guess, in the next month or so. Uh, one on uh, essentially soil and water management and uh, and the other one is on hydrology and hydraulics so that you uh, know how flow through structures works and have a good background on uh, the general hydrologic cycle as well that'll help you do the same kind of problems that we're talking about tonight. This will set the stage for both of them and, and where it's appropriate I'll also point forward to which parts of the uh, future presentations that a uh, specific principle is really important to do have several sources. Um, to be honest, if you're going to carry one book for the soil and water stuff, it would be a recent edition of that Soil and Water Conservation Engineering. Um, uh, ASABE started uh, printing and publishing uh, the uh, the book. That's why you see sixth slash seventh edition. The sixth edition was printed and published by another publisher who decided there just wasn't enough volume. They weren't going to do it anymore, so ASABE picked it up because this is the standard book for soil and water conservation engineering. So I'd recommend you pick one up. I happened to find one that had a little crease in the cover at the ASABE meeting and picked it up for half price. So um, I happen to own all seven editions. Uh, I think my original one from college was 
the uh, fourth edition, that first one that's up there. Maybe it was third edition, but there were a couple of early ones. That book was written back in the 50s and has been revised multiple times and uh, has SI units have been added, uh, I think, to the four editions you're seeing there on the screen. So it's a good reference to have. Um, it covers the whole breadth of everything. The two other references, the top and the bottom of the sources screen there, are more in-depth references. The bottom one uh, deals specifically with uh, disturbed uh, lands, such as mining lands, um, and, and is invaluable if you get into that kind of a situation. But as far as if you're going to pick one book for the... Uh, for the exam that's in the Solon Water area, I'd go with Schwab, or now it's Huffman et al., uh, just because of the breadth of the uh, coverage of the materials. And by the way, anytime you have a question, uh, interrupt me. I do get a pretty good uh, indication if you happen to hit the, uh, the raise hand button. So uh, you know, feel free or, or jump in on your microphone and, and get me to pause especially if there's something that I'm just going too fast over and you've got questions. And then there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. First thing I want to do is review some of the assumptions. And this is something that it's, you'd think it'd be something we always get covered in, in, a, basic, in a basic course, but the presumption is that you've had fluids in some manner. And, I mean, you may not have, depending on the background and the uh, the uh, path that you took through an ag engineering degree, uh, you know, you might not have been exposed to as much of this as some of the others. So I always like to get it stated up front that uh, so you know what's going on. So the assumptions we're going to deal with here when we're talking about fluids is water, first of all, in its liquid state. Uh, air is a fluid as well, but boy, the assumptions have to be different. So that's why I specify we're talking about water. Uh, low dissolved contaminants, low suspended contaminants, and that brings that density into about the one kilogram per liter, one milligram per, or excuse me, yeah, one milligram per milliliter, or excuse me, one gram per milliliter. Um, the density of one is important, and you'll see why later on. That's kilogram per liter. Uh, gram per milliliter. Uh, it is inco incompressible, which changes the equations from the ones you'd use for uh, air, for example, which is compressible. And mass is conserved in these assumptions, so that you know you could, you can use a conservation of mass version of an equation, and and it's one of the fundamental equations you'd want to be using to make sure things are operating like you think they are. So so those are the basic assumptions. Basic nomenclature, so you get comfortable with it. I already used rho once, which is density. Units are mass per volume. And while I was kind of muffling the, the uh, milligram one, it is kilograms per liter, grams per cc or milliliter, cubic centimeter or milliliter. Uh, the, the English unit has a weird one on it. It's slugs is the English unit for mass. You're used to thinking about pounds, which is the English unit for force. Um, so you have to pay attention to that if you're going to deal with English units. It's not as uh, as clean as you might think it is. And there's others that you could use as well if you really wanted to. Flow rate is usually capital Q. Not always, but usually. And it's got a unit of volume per time. So cubic feet per second is very, very typical. Cubic meters per second is very typical. Gallons per minute, liters per minute, etc. Uh, paying attention to flow rates import, or the units are very important, as you'll see later on. Uh, velocity, normal, length per time, feet per second, meters per second. Sometimes you could see miles an hour, but not normally when we're talking about fluid flow. Um, and then area of flow is usually capital A, obviously. Uh, length squared, so square feet, square meters. Um, you know, if we're talking about area of a pond, so we're talking about surface area, then you can start getting into acres, etc. So flow rate's the basic relationship between, or, or the basic relationship, excuse me, between flow rate and velocity is that Q, or flow rate, 
is equal to the velocity times the area over which that velocity is acting. Now, this is assuming an average velocity and the area at a specific point in the flow. So that, as you can expect, that's going to vary all over. The velocity actually varies typically at a given point across the width and depth. Uh, but in general, if you use an average velocity times the area at that given point, that will be the flow rate at that given point. So that's a statement of conservation of mass. Given that energy is constant as well, you can also use an energy balance equation. And that's where we get one of the equations of flow. This first energy balance equation, and I'm hoping my uh, animation works correctly because I've tweaked it and hopefully everything's all set, um, is called the Bernoulli's equation. And essentially what it's doing is it's taking parameters that describe the flow, in this case an elevation, a pressure, a velocity, and converting them to the same units. So if you think about it, and let's just put some units on it, height or elevation is in, let's just use English units, or is in feet, okay? Pressure is typically pounds per something, okay? So that would be the P's. Specific weight of a fluid, since we're in English, it would be in pounds, per cubic something, okay? And if you're going to get dimensionless properly, it's got to match up between the numerator and the denominator of each one of these. Um, velocity is going to be in feet per second. If you remember the gravitational acceleration of g, that's 32.2 feet per second squared. So right there, if you do the unit conversion, it comes out in feet, just like the elevation does. If you do the pressure in pounds per square foot, not pounds per inch, then if you do the fluid uh, specific weight in pounds per cubic foot, when you do that division, you end up with feet again. Uh, w is the energy that's added by a device, like a pump. F is the energy used to overcome friction. All of those are in uh, the energy unit of height, which is a little It's hard to describe, but it's a conversion because of how it's acting. We'll get into a little bit more detail in here in a second, but let's take a look at it. Potential energy, then, if you take it in these terms, would be the two height terms. Energy stored in the pressure itself would be those two terms, and those will work their way through it. Kinetic energy is uh, velocity squared and then you've got input and output which is essentially friction so let's use an, let's do an example we've got a situation and you've got a lot that's 90 feet above a lake which is your water source you've got a nice garden up there you need some irrigation water and you want to take it out of the lake so location one is the lake, location two is a tank. Height one, we'll just set it zero. That's the lake surface. Height two, since we said it was 90 feet above, will be 90 feet. Velocity at the surface is zero. Velocity at the uh, tank depends upon how fast things are flowing. Pressure at the um, lake is zero and unless you want to really take height into account and in 90 feet the pressure of the atmosphere does not change enough but you I mean you could do it if you really wanted it in there but we're going to assume that's negligible and zero F is going to depend upon the size of the pipe and the fittings and frankly that's a whole nother seminar and I've done some calculations on it it really depends on what size pipe you use and, the, and what kind of pipe you use and the fittings you use and whether or not you're really efficient on it, whether you have smooth entrances and exits. Um, it, it literally is another webinar. Uh, I did enough calculation on it that 20 is a reasonable assumption. 
and the owner wants to fill that 500 gallon tank in two hours and he's already installed a three-quarter inch pipe which actually I this is an actual problem uh, and I was not happy that he had already installed the three-quarter inch pipe because it really constrains the problem but that's what he did so that's what you got okay how are you going to attack this well I use Bernoulli's rearrange to solve for W because that's the input you need okay Let's see if things work now okay rearranging for it let's separate the unit the, the problem out so you've got H you got the heights together you got the pressures together you've got the velocities together you add on the friction so that we can go ahead and solve it the two pressures we assume to be the same Q the flow rate that's required he wants 500 gallons in two hours okay now gallons per minute or gallons per hour even does not help us much because if you're gonna make this thing work you've got to have units that balance so you want velocity in feet per second you want flow rate in cubic feet per second so that you can do the averages to get that velocity so here's what we did I converted it the 500 gallon in two hours to 500 gallons is 120 minutes then took that to seconds and then did the gallons to cubic feet and you end up with 0 0.0093 cubic feet per second the area is three quarters of an inch squared you got to convert that to square feet so that's why the divide by 144 and if you remember the formula for area it's the diameter squared times pi divided by 4 and then you've got the unit conversion so you end up with 0.03 square feet so the velocity at the far end when it's coming out of the pipe if you're right at the flow rate he wants is 3.1 feet per second so if you go in and solve you've got W is the difference in height You've got no difference in pressure, and you've got the velocity that has to be at the end of the pipe if you're going to get 500 gallons in two hours. And you've got the friction that I assumed, but is pretty close to what it would be. So when you add all that together, you essentially have 110 feet of head. Okay. So when you go to buy a pump, You need to take that information with you, and it needs to deliver at least 4.2 gallons per minute, which is 500 gallons in two hours, against 110 feet ahead. Now, why am I specking it that way? Because I've looked at enough pumps to know that those are the data that it's going to want. Now, another, the, the latter piece of data, that 110 feet, may actually be listed as against a pressure. So if it can develop 4.2 gallons per minute with 48 pounds per square inch at the pump housing, it'll get the velocity you need at the top end because that's what it's pumping against. The conversion, and this is one of those tables that you need to know where it is in your references if you don't have them in your head already, and that's some of these unit conversions. And if you're going to do uh, feet of head to pounds per square inch of pressure 2.31 is the factor that you want to remember it's mainly used in irrigation um, but 110 feet divided by 2.31 feet per head of head per uh, pound per square inch gives you 48 pounds per square inch so if you go to a uh, big box store or a farm supply store and you find a pump that says it'll do five gallons a minute at 50 psi that's going to do what you want that'll give it to him uh, the 500 gallons in a quicker time than 120 minutes as long as the uh, three-quarter inch uh, pipe is flowing freely so that's how you go about it that's how you use Bernoulli's equation to solve that kind of a problem and most of it's getting the pieces of that equation into the right units that's the hardest part of that particular one once you know the equation okay any questions on that one
I mean, the fluid basics are pretty straightforward. You can follow a flow line, and energy is going to work through that as long as you take uh, inputs and friction into account. And otherwise, you can just do unit conversion and balance it. Um, if you're going to tab this in one of the books, uh, you'd want energy balance is probably what you'd want to put on it. Or if you can find a tab that you can write Bernoulli's on, you could do that too. Um, but that was what I found. I took this exam quite a while ago. And let me just step in for a second and, and share one thing with you. Um, take it, take this exam as soon as you feel prepared for it. Um, I put it off. I passed the uh, FE exam, which was called the EIT when I took it, uh, right after I finished my master's degree. So I had that exam done in 1980. I finally got around to taking the PE in 2000, and it was the last time. It was the previous format of the Aggie exam, uh, where you had choices of problems instead of just the 80 problems that you get to do now. Um, it was tough. Now, if I wasn't someone who was teaching this stuff, um, I probably would not have done there as well, but because I had done so many uh, problems uh, you know, on the chalkboard, uh, you know, I could get away with it. My recommendation to you is uh, take it as soon as you're ready. And as far as references, I was on the faculty working full time, so I didn't have much time to study. The one thing I did do that saved me was put uh, tabs on my references, which I think they still allow you to do. And essentially, it was the uh, you know you could do it with the uh, with sticky notes, and but it's better if you have actual tabs that you can just put on the pages that uh, and then put a one word on the sticky note that tells you what is on that page, and, and that'll help you more than anything with uh, with references of being able to get to what you need. Excuse me, quickly. Okay. Let's talk about soil and water basics for a little bit. We'll look at soil classes and the different particle size distributions. And then we'll talk about what the components of soil are and the soil water portion of that specifically so that you get a feel for how that works when we get into a porous media, which soil is. Soil is made up of essentially four components in various amounts. We get the mineral part, the water part, which comes and goes, the air, which displaces, that fills whatever's there when the water isn't there, because there's voids between the mineral particles. And then there's organic matter as well, which is goes from very, very small amount to maybe 10% at the most, kind of that range, if you've got an organic soil, or a high organic soil. Um, so organic matter is one that is pretty much ignored in a lot of the stuff we're about to talk about, but realize it is there and it is important, especially when we talk about water quality stuff later on. The mineral component is made up of individual particles of various sizes. Now, it gets confusing because the soil type, which we'll talk about in a minute, uses the very same words that the particles are described as, that is, silt, sand, silt, clay. They, it uses some other descriptors too, but those three are definitely there. In the case of the particles themselves, sand, silt, and clay are defined by the size of the particle, not by what the particle is made of. So sand, silt, and clay are, are the primary particles that we'll talk about here in a minute by their size. Now, we also have aggregates in soil, and essentially what these are are those primary particles that grab together by electrical or chemical attraction and act as a particle, uh, as a unit of a bunch of different small particles. They're going to be tend to be in the silt and sand sizes, and they're going to be less dense than the primary particles because they've got some air or water in them that uh, you know, so that they're not 100% mineral. Okay, 
there's different particle size classification systems. Um, there's an international soil of, or international so society of soil science one where everything is in twos. So the clays are particles smaller than uh, 0 0.02, 0 0.02 millimeters. Silt is 0 0.02 millimeters down to the clay. Uh, fine sand is 0.2 down to 0 0.02. Coarse sand is 2 down to 0 0.2 and gravels above that. So everything's all nice. You don't have to remember it too much. When you get down to USDA and the uh, Public Roads Administration, they start using other stuff. And in the case of USDA, which is the one you'll probably see the most because it's the one that gets used in the soil surveys that are put out by uh, NRCS, um, clay is the same as... ISSS, uh, the sand silt interface is a little coarser at 0.05 or 50 microns. The gravel is at the same spot, and then they divide the sand into five different subclasses uh, at different sizes. Then when you get down to the Public Roads Administration, they mess it all up again in that they keep the sand silt at the same interface, the gravel sand at the same interface, they define fine and coarse differently, and then they define clay differently. So the one probably to know the best is the middle one, the USDA. And that's the one we'll use here to uh, talk about a soil type in a, in a minute or two. Actually, we'll do it right now. The USDA textural triangle uses that uh, separation. So its definition of clay for the percent clay, and i got to always remember that if I want to have a pointer, i got to grab it. This percent clay, let me get the jaw out of there. This percent clay, the clay they're talking about, is particles smaller than 2 microns, or 0 0.002 millimeters. The silt, then, is 0 0.05, and down to the clay size, and the sand is from 0 0.05 millimeters up to 2 millimeters. If you separate a sediment sample um, by putting some special chemistry in there that causes it to not grab together anymore and shake it all up and run it through a sieve, you can separate it out into these different percentages. And that will define the soil texture that you're dealing with. This triangle is pretty straightforward in that you, you just enter it and uh, define what the soil is by those different textures. Now, let me just use an example. It's the easiest way to do it. We dispersed a soil sample. We've just got primary particles. We figured out it's 20% clay, 30% silt, 50% sand. So what's the texture? Well, all you've got to do is take that data and enter this chart. So if we've got 20% clay, you've just got a line all the way across there. That's all of the of different soil types that have 20% clay. Then we add another line, which is the silt line. So you got 30% silt. Well, since we got 100%, that dictates the other line, which if I drew it right, better. Oh, I didn't even draw it. It would come, obviously, right through this point. It has to. So the 50% sand line is right here, so I'm off just a hair. But the answer is loam, because it's in this quadrant where the loam is. I keep forgetting I've got to have the arrow in my hand, so to speak. But that loam quadrant is the textural class, then, where that you would find a description in the soil survey about what loam is and its characteristics. And there's a specific name for it, too, which would also have information in a soil survey. I see Justin is typing. Okay, if you're in an intersection, it could be defined a, a, you know, some different ways. So let's look at the example you just gave. We've got 40% clay, which comes across, and you're right here. Let's see, 40% clay, 40% silt. You're right in this no, never, never land here of all three of those coming together. I would think they would probably look at... Um, 
the characteristics of it and define it as one of those three or four that are together. Um, or go back and redo it, and my guess is you'd figure it out that you're a little bit off in one or the other so that it would shift. Um, but, yeah, that's a good question. And I've not asked a soil scientist what they would do in that case, but I suspect they would shift it to a known soil that has the classification that exhibits similar uh, characteristics would be my guess. Um, don't worry about it on the exam. I don't think they would do that kind of a trick question. Um, so, okay. So let's talk about infiltration for a minute. First of all, you need to know what I'm talking about. Infiltration is the passage of water through that soil air interface, so essentially through the surface, into pores within that block of soil. And once it's gone through that surface, it can be in the really fine pores, the capillaries, or if it's got root holes or worm holes, it could go into macropore flow. And the latter is something that's a not a new phenomenon, but it's something that we've realized is really important maybe in the last 30 years. Um, because it's a direct connection to lower portions, which means if you've got a contaminant that's uh, in the water that's flowing down that macropore, it can go pretty deep pretty quick um, if those things exist and they're continuous. Uh, it's probably even more important because of the ad, and it's been a, a uh, subject of study and speculation and a lot of other things in the last 30 years because of the advent of, of no-till, because if you think about it, if you're going out there like we used to and you plow it and then go across with a disc a couple times, then go across with a harrow a couple times, maybe three times even if you want it really fluffy and what uh, my technician at Kentucky when I was in grad school used to call a lettuce bed, um, you know, you've wiped out all those continuous connections where now if you don't do anything except plant, because you've got a heavy planter that'll cut through the residue, 80% of the surface may have uh, wormholes that come all the way from the surface and go all the way down. Or maybe this was formerly a, a field with alfalfa in it, and that's been knocked down so that you could plant in it. And those roots go a long way down. So there's different mechanisms that happen. Uh, when we start talking about macropore. So I want you to be aware that that's there. And then infiltrated water can reappear as surface runoff uh, two ways, essentially. Inner flow, which usually doesn't happen unless we're talking about a forested watershed where there might be a, a uh, rock ledge at a few feet down or maybe a foot down, and water hits it and runs along it and then comes back out as a spring. Or subsurface drainage is another way to essentially intercept water on its way to groundwater and send it back to surface. So you got to keep these in mind when we start talking about runoff. And that's a, another webinar, but it'll come up. Now, the inner particle voids, or the spaces, the voids, could have air, could have water. And the amount of voids is going to depend on the texture, essentially the distribution of different size particles. And if you think about it, you've probably seen the example that uh, you know, if you if you put golf balls in a mason jar first, and then you put some pea gravel, and then you put regular sand, you can get a whole lot more in it than if you put it in the other order. And it's the same way here. If you've got a lot of different size particles, the openings are big, and they can fill in with other stuff. If you've got really small uh, voids, then you can't get a whole lot into them, and, and you've got less air and water. You'll see uh, examples of this later on. And then, of course, if it's been tilled or compacted, it's changing the condition. But it doesn't change it as much as the different textures might dictate. Let's talk about the different levels of soil water content for a minute, because uh, these are some terms you've heard. Um, but they have specific definitions, uh, and they'll vary by texture and condition so that uh, they have to be defined for uh, each different soil and, and the condition that they're under. Saturation, 
means all voids are filled with water. It very seldom happens naturally uh, because it depends on how it's saturated. If it's coming up from below, let's say you've got groundwater that, that is working its way up toward the surface for whatever reason, um, then the air has a chance to escape ahead of that wetting front that's coming from the bottom up. But if you've got a nice heavy rainstorm that uh, the water soaks into the uh, soil from, and it's then the wetting front is moving downward, now the air doesn't have a good way to get out of the way. So typically, a soil does not fully saturate based on rainfall conditions. It'll reach a, a kind of a steady state that's been termed field saturation which varies it as a percentage of saturation depending on, again, the pore size. When I was doing my master's uh, a long time ago at Minnesota, uh, I was looking at this very phenomenon. And in really sandy soils, it tended to stabilize at about 95% of the saturation that you could get if you filled that soil up from the bottom and slowly filled it with soil and then measured it. Uh, once it was full, um, the field saturation was about 95% of that. If you get into finer textured soils, uh, a, uh, a silty clay loam, for example, if I remember right, was about 80%. So there's a fair difference between the different textures. Um, field capacity, by definition, is the state at which the water that can leave by gravity has done so. Um, it, Depends on the situation we're talking about and the soil we're talking about. It could be anywhere from a tenth of a bar or a tenth of an atmosphere to a third of an atmosphere to push the water out or pull the water out of the pores from gra by gravity. And, and that's a, actually a definition and a concept that some of the soil physicists want to argue whether it really even exists. But it's a very useful concept, especially when we get to drainage because the water between it and saturation is the water that the drainage system has to be de de uh, designed to convey over whatever period of time you want to get the field down to field capacity. Wilting point is the point at which water ceases to be extractable by plant roots. It's defined as a, and it's probably an arbitrary point, but you had to have a point of some kind at 15 bars or 15 atmospheres. So if you think about it, you've got a, the plant roots can exert up to 225 round, with, you know, round figure, 225 pounds per square inch of suction on that soil to pull water out. Now, if, for those of you who haven't uh, had a chance to take a, a soil properties lab somewhere through your career, essentially what we do with these is we've got uh, pressure tanks or, or compressor that can be uh, finely tuned uh, with, with uh, valves and stuff so that we could put uh, a third of a bar, which would be a, not even uh, two pounds per square inch, on an apparatus that's got soil with water in it and there's a porous plate underneath that soil sample and the pressure that you put in forces whatever water can go through forces water through that porous plate until the pressure's equal okay and that porous plate will let water through but not air it's a ceramic plate with the wilting point it's the same thing except we're putting 225 pounds per square inch on that that's forcing the water through that ceramic plate. And as you'd expect, pretty darn dry. Interestingly enough, there's another even drier point that uh, all the water that can be removed by usual means, of uh, typically putting it in an oven, uh, all of that's gone too. And they consider that at 30 atmospheres. So if you do that math, we're talking about 450 pounds per square inch, which is a lot of pressure pushing stuff out of a soil sample. Um, now, to use those concepts, and, and this is the same thing we've kind of been talking about, the, the, the pores are full or have some air and water. Very little water are the three 
concepts, and this is the concept when we start talking about drainage. Um, field capacity, the water will flow through down to that point. Then it's sitting there, the, the plants can get to it because it's not down to wilting point yet, and then below that the plants can't even get to it, hence the title wilting point. Across the U.S., now let me back up one. This is a concept when we get to irrigation later on. The plant available water is the water content between the field capacity, which is the stuff that can drain naturally away, and that wilting point. So essentially what we're doing is we're defining the soil as a storage tank, and we're going to use the water that's held in those micropores, but aren't held so tightly that plants can't get to them. And that's going to be our water that we replenish by irrigation so that the crops can continue to grow when it's not raining. So we define that volume as the difference between field capacity and wilting point. We call that plant available water. This chart is the based on the soil series that uh, are on these locations across the U.S., what the plant available water looks like. And if you stop and think about it, you start noticing that the places where you remember seeing irrigation, like the uh, central plains of Nebraska, uh, into Colorado, um, those are the spots you see irrigation all the time. Well, that's because the plant available water is lower in California and some of the valleys, etc. In East Central Illinois, you have pretty dark green, and that's why you don't see a whole lot of irrigation going on in that part of the state. Why? Because there's so much plant available water that irrigation doesn't pay. You only use it maybe one out of three or four or five years, and they're expensive, so especially developing the well and stuff. So it's really not worth having. You just deal with it. Um, so you can almost look at the use of uh, irrigation systems in here, and in fact, if you look close, let's see if I can get my, ah, it's my arrow in this particular picture, I guess. Um, the uh, you can look on Illinois, and just the um, in the center toward the west, you'll see some yellow. That's the outwash sands area along the Illinois River, Mason County, Tazewell County. A lot of irrigation there, uh, but that's the only spot in the state where there's lots of irrigation. So it happens to be a very sandy soil area. And the texture dictates what that soil water holding capacity is. And this is all published. You can get it out of soil surveys. You can get it out of irrigation guides. But in general, uh, the silt and clay loams we are. Oh, that's why it was there. I just couldn't see it because it was the same color as the background. The silt and clay loams here have the highest uh, soil water holding capacity. In other words, the biggest difference between um, field capacity and wilting point of all the soils, those also happen to have the most uh, diverse uh, textural classes. It's got a lot of each of the different particle sizes. So you've got a lot of uh, inter-particle voids that get water in them, and they're held. And they're small enough to hold it against gravity. So, so those are the ones that you're going to find uh, less irrigation on, and that's what mostly we have in Illinois. Here's another way of looking at it. And this will all be very important when we get to drainage and irrigation, because it's this gravitational water up here that is what you remove by a drainage system, but you really don't have to um, drain it if it's in a very sandy because it goes away by itself. It's when you get up here in the silt loams and clay loams where it might not be as much gravitational water, but it doesn't move very easy. That's where you end up with the drainage. Plan available. You don't have irrigation much in these, as we already talked about, but you get down here in the sandy and the sandy loams, and you'll have a lot of irrigation in, in it because you just don't have that much plant available water. Okay, so here's where I tie it forward. 
Uh, we will discuss drainage, gravitational water uh, between saturation and field capacity, and it's the volume that you've got to deal with uh, with the drainage system. Um, it's going to dictate how uh, wet the soil is going to be, how important the drainage will be to the crop, um, and the system design itself if you're trying to convey it away. When we get to irrigation, then it's that plant available water uh, that's between field capacity and wilting point, and that's what we manage via irrigation. So uh, we'll, in, the, in a latter webinar, we'll actually talk through, okay, how, how many days can you go without uh, re-irrigating based on the soil that you're on and uh, the depth of the roots that a uh, specific crop is uh, going to have. Okay. Questions? I'm moving quick, maybe too quick. If I am, let me know. Any questions on what you just saw? Hopefully it's a review, but it, you know, can spark some memories from when you took it. Okay. Let's talk about soil erosion a little bit. First thing to realize is uh, pretty conceptual, actually, but that soil erosion is a multi-step process, kind of by definition. Uh, first, it's got a, a soil particle or an aggregate has to be detached. Then it's got to get moved. And the forces that do those two things may be different. Um, and then, if we're going to worry about it, if it's going to have an impact, uh, it'll have to be redeposited somewhere. Uh, typically, what we're talking about is, you know, if we're just talking about crop production, the detachment and transport itself is a problem because it's removing the topsoil, which is the most uh, uh, useful part of the soil for growing a crop, and it's taking it away and it's leaving the field. Um, the other side of it is, when it leaves the field, it's going to deposit somewhere, and if that's all the way down in the Gulf of Mexico, then all of a sudden Louisiana is getting bigger. But if it's in a ditch, then it takes maintenance costs to clean it back out. If it's in a pond, it takes some of your volume away, that, and it may change the species of fish because it's all of a sudden getting muddier, etc. So it's a process that you've got to pay attention to. But you've got to have both the detachment and transport to call it erosion and then deposition will occur somewhere uh, when the water slows down. So there are two parts of the process so that you realize that it is a, a multi-step. I mean, and you've got to have both of the first two to call it erosion. And it also gives us hints then on how to control it. So we just talked about the soils. There's a couple of things here that weren't necessarily there. The, the, Primary particles, we're going to call the sand, the silt, and the clay. I'm using USDA uh, boundaries. Density becomes important, and you'll see why here in a minute. Um, typically, for sand and silt, an assumption of uh, the same density as quartz particles is a pretty good one. Now, there are some soils that their primary particles, because of their mineral makeup, are denser than this. Now, I was dealing with some when I was doing my doctoral work in Kentucky that were well above 2.7 because of the minerals that were in the soil particles. But in general, unless you know something is, is weird about the particular soil you're dealing with, 2.65 is, is the assumption you'd use. Uh, clay particles tend to be just a hair less dense. If you use 265 all the way through, you're going to be you're going to be fine. Um, then the aggregates, the chemically electrically bonded sets of primary particles. If they're large ones in the sand range, they tend to have more void, so that's why they're defined as 1.6 as a dense as a bulk density. And the smaller ones, kind of in the larger silt range, are more like a 1.8. And and these are the the definitions are pretty much what was used in the Creams model that was developed back in the 80s, so long ago now, but was pretty much the standard, and it set a lot of these assumptions because they did a lot of digging and figured out what 
uh, made most sense. So we start talking about detachment. The forces that are there, the energy that gets used up to do the detachment can come from many different things. But the main ones would be raindrop impact, depends on how heavy it's raining, uh, how big the drops are, uh, shallow surface flow, where it's flowing across the surface and exerting a, a, a lateral shear on that soil surface. Uh, concentrated flow shear, essentially channelized, but in small channels on a soil surface, you'll get even increased amount of lateral shear, moving, potentially removing some soil. And then as we get to larger scales, you get a lot of other forces and things. We're talking about gully, it could be head cuts, could be wall sloughing. Lots of things going on as scale changes. But the basic concepts are these. The biggest one by far, unless the soil is pretty steep, is going to be raindrop impact. On the transport side, a lot of the same forces, but they act differently. Okay, Raindrop impact, for example. If the soil surface is perfectly level, Raindrop impact will transport, but it pretty much transports the same in all directions. Why? Because it's level. I mean, this, think about it. The splash would be pretty much symmetric, and it's going to transport about the same. Now, you give me a sloping soil, and they've done the research on it, and it just makes sense when you draw a picture in your mind of it. When that drop hits the uh, sloping surface, more of it, more of the splash is going to go downhill than uphill. Well, then it's going to take more soil with it. So as the slope gets steeper, the raindrop splash transport gets more. There's a lot of capacity in shallow surface flow, a, even more capacity in concentrated surface flow where you get water flowing in little nicks and, and small micro channels on the surface. And then as it channelizes, you get even more transport. So scale, it gets more and more and more. Now, the interesting thing is there is a balancing act that uh, George Foster and uh, Larry Meyer proposed back. Shoot, I'm starting to feel old now because that's, what, 45 years ago almost? Um, but the idea being that there's only so much energy in a given flow. And it can be used up transporting, or it can be used up detaching, but you've only got so much. So if you're at 50% transport load compared to capacity, you can only be at 50% of the detachment compared to detachment capacity if you didn't have any transport going on. So the balancing act is, was proposed by them, and it actually works pretty well in, in concept. And interestingly enough, explains one phenomena that uh, we've talked about through the years, which I'll get to here in a minute. The idea, if it's using all its capacity, using all of its transport capacity, you don't have any more energy to transport. And, and the flip side works, too. So. Things are in balance. Now, here's my example. And I noticed this because I was starting my career back here in the in the 80s. There was a very successful push to use conservation tillage all the way to no-till to reduce sediment into lakes and streams. In Illinois, it was called T by 2000, and there have been other programs uh, similar in other states. The problem was when they went and measured the sediment reaching the lakes, they didn't see improvement. But through the 80s and 90s, the, uh, the issue of stream bank erosion came to the forefront. And it was really an issue in some, some streams. And what I contend, and it was kind of a voice in the wilderness when I first talked about it, but it's kind of been proven out by some folks now, is that the streams were receiving a lot cleaner water. They didn't have as much sediment load in the water they, that was coming into them. Therefore, there was a lot more energy available to detach right there in the stream because it wasn't using it to transport the load that was being delivered to it. So the 
really nice erosion control upstream on the fields really didn't help the um, lakes all that much. Why? Because the ability to um, detach right there in the stream bed and on the stream bank really increased and sediment is sediment when it gets to the lake. So there was a lot of issues and the, then we started working on control of stream bank erosion and started stabilizing the streams. Then we started seeing some water quality improvement. So it, it's uh, you got to look at the whole system sometimes. So what I've been talking about is multi-stage erosion. Essentially you get raindrop erosion on some of the surface. Actually it's on all of the surface. You get raindrop detachment and at the at the very top, the only mechanisms are raindrop detachment and raindrop transport. When you get in the middle, you've still got the detachment from the raindrops, but you've got thin surface flow, used to be termed sheet erosion or sheet flow. Um, doing the transport, probably not too much detachment. Then as the channels get bigger and bigger, things start to accumulate. You start to get a little more energy. They can transport more, but they can also detach more. And then you start getting incisement, so it starts cutting its own channel. You get a lot of detachment due to the flow, and of course the transport is there too. And it gets get bigger and bigger. So you've got a lot of things going on on a given surface, uh, some of it all in the same spot. Now, sediment transport. One of the things that's a concept you need to be aware of. Um, it comes into control. It comes into the transport of sediment and that is a thing called Stokes' Law. Essentially what it is, is a calculation of balance in that you've got a soil particle, and this actually works if you wanted to calculate it for a raindrop too in, in atmosphere, the numbers are just different, uh, the constants are different, but essentially you're looking at the balance of forces on a particle in a water uh, tank so that it's falling at a constant velocity. Because if you remember from your basic physics, if there's a force on something, it's going to accelerate. And as long as that force is constant, the acceleration will be constant. If you've got a constant velocity, that means there's no acceleration. That means the forces, the net forces on a particle need to be zero. And that's what this equation does. Um, so what you've got here, you've got the settling velocity, uh, the 18 is a conversion from the units that are being used, you've got a particle diameter in millimeters, you've got a velocity settling in feet per second, now this is down in the bottom one, you could have them on any kind of units up in the top one. Um, yeah, and I'm trying to remember back exactly because I've derived this equation a long time ago. It's also the same with in the text. And the 18 is not a conversion. It's actually part of the equation. Um, SG is specific gravity of the particle. So essentially the bulk density divided by 1 for water that defines specific gravity. You're subtracting off 1 for the difference between the specific gravity of the water and 1, which is specific gravity of water, excuse me, specific gravity of the particle minus 1 with specific gravity of water. So you've got a difference there, and then the other, uh, the diameter, gravitational acceleration, kinematic viscosity. The nice thing is they've gone through and done all the unit conversions and brought it down to a function straight up of diameter. Okay, diameter in millimeters is the lower equation on the on the screen, this one. Settling velocity is just a constant times diameter of the particle in millimeters. And the settling velocity is in feet per second. The assumption, specific gravity is 2.65, so that quartz density. And then quiet water, so you don't have any weird lateral forces. All you've got is a tank of water sitting there. So you've got buoyancy forces and, and, and gravitational forces and that's it. And then 68 degrees and what the 68 degrees does is it dictates this kinematic viscosity. So 
how do you use that for anything? Well, when you start talking about um, sediment control, if you wanted to settle a certain distance to get into a sediment trap while, you know, crossing a length of that trap, you need to know how fast things are settling. That'll tell you what size particles you're going to be able to trap. So in this case, let's just go ahead and use the information and find the settling velocities of the largest sand, which would be two millimeters, the largest silt, largest clay, based on the International Soil Science Society breakdown. Now, if you remember that, those were all twos. You had two, mil two microns, tw 20 microns, 2,000 microns are the separations. And if you do the math, just throw these into the equation. You're squaring 2 millimeters, multiplying by 281 and doing conversions to get these different units. You've got very small feet per second. You end up with not quite a foot per day. This is for the largest of the clay particles. On the silts, you're looking at almost 100 feet per day, about 4 feet per hour. On the sands, you're looking at really quick drop, you know, feet per second over 10. So that's why when you look at uh, sediment trap efficiencies, they're really, really high in sandy soils, really, really low if if not non-existent in clay soils, and it's the silt ones that you may or may not trap depending upon what you're doing. But that's how you would calculate the settling velocities for those various things. Of course, if you've got different units and you're going to you just back up, if you've got different units and you're going to use this equation, you've got to do unit conversion first. And that's one of the things that can get you on the exam if you're not paying attention. Make sure your units work. You can bet the evil engineers and professors that are writing this thing are going to make sure that if you don't do a unit conversion, one of the multiple choice answers that you can choose from will be one that you would get if you didn't do the right unit conversion. So check it every time. Just make sure you're using the right units for the equation you're picking to use. It's probably the easiest thing to not mess up on. OK, another, another Stokes example. Particles larger than what size can assume to settle one foot in an hour? So let's say you've got a got a trap that requires that they settle a foot to get caught in it and you want to know okay how you know how what size can I do if I keep that in there for an hour okay essentially what you do is you rearrange you set the settling velocity at one foot per one hour You've got to do the unit conversion to get it in feet per second so it ends up being 2.8 times 10 to the minus 4 feet per second okay then you solve for diameter. So you just pop that in there, get what it is, take the square root of it, and you end up with essentially 0.01 millimeters. Now, this is one thing I, uh, the exams, because they're multiple choice, unless they're actually quizzing you on significant digits, uh, you're not going to have to deal with it. But one thing that I was always really picky about when I was teaching was to ask students who gave me 10 decimal places off of their calculator whether they really believed that they were that precise. Because you need to pay attention. And, and those of you that are practicing engineers know you have to pay attention to what you're truly going to specify. And in this case, since you've got only two decimal places in the 2.81, or you got three there, but you've got you know, very limited number of decimal places, giving me five um, in, in scientific notation with the final answer is not reasonable. You probably want to be down about two, and I could specify that one that's, that's there, the point, 0.010 could be 0.01. 
2.00, .00, I guess, because you do have 3 in the 2.81. The 3600 is a conversion factor, so that's exact. Um, so that one really doesn't count, but, you know, pay attention to those kinds of things, too. Actually, the regular and simplified are exactly the same. It's just, are you going to specify the uh, units or not? Um, because all, let me just back up to them, all this 2.81 is, is using this assumption. I guess if you don't have these assumptions available to you, if if you are told that you're going to use, uh, you want to know the settling velocity of an aggregate that's 1.6 specific gravity, then you're going to have to put that in here and solve for the whole thing. And you're going to have to be able to look up a kinematic viscosity uh, at a certain temperature. So you'll need to know what the temperature of the water is. The, these assumptions are what dictate the 2.81. So if you can't use those assumptions, then you got to go back to the whole equation. So that that'd be the deal. Uh, most of the time you can you can go ahead and use it, but if you get a situation where it specifies an aggregate or you're dealing with a different fluid, that would change things too. Let's say you you've got a uh, something that's settling in alcohol. Well now you've got to use something other than one here because that's the definition of specific gravity of water. So you have to use a different equation in those specific examples. But for the most part, if these assumptions hold, you're OK. Anything else on this one? Most of the time, to be honest, you'd be going into a table in a reference and just taking the particle size, going across to a, to a curve, and down to a chart, and reading it. That There's lots of those out there. So most of the time, you're going to do it a different way. But that equation is available to you if you can tolerate those assumptions. Now, how do we deal with control? Well, we can use the same concepts we've been talking about with the process to at least start talking about things we can do to control soil. Um, and you limit the, the individual parts. So if you can limit detachment or you can limit transport, since you need both, you can knock the erosion down pretty well. And on the deposition side, what you want to do is enhance it strategically so that you want to have it drop out in a ditch where it's easy to clean out or where nobody cares. Maybe you've built a ditch with the grass in it specifically for that purpose. And that's essentially what a, a grass filter strip is, um, that you enhance the deposition where it's not going to hurt anything. So let's take it a little bit further. So let's talk about control of soil erosion by water. You can limit detachment a lot of different ways. You can limit raindrop impact. You can limit the runoff itself. You can limit the capacity of the runoff to detach. You can increase the soil resistance. On the transport limiting, less volume will do it. Knocking the transport capacity, that runoff down will do it. Now, those are nice terms. How do you do that? Well, let's use no-till as an example. Raindrop impact is very low. Why? Because the raindrop doesn't reach the soil surface. That's the whole idea behind leaving all that residue on the soil surface is that the raindrops can't reach the soil. Flow shear detachment is lower if once you get water flowing why because all of that set or all of that residue in the way there's not a straight path for that water to flow so it's got to do a lot of twisting and turning and every time it does that it slows down and you've got some sediment that's gonna fall out if it's already in it or the shear forces because when you do a winding flow path you're effectively dropping the slope that that flow is utilizing, you're not going to have the forces. And then soil is more resistant because you don't have much disturbance. It's going to be a little denser. You're going to have where it has been incorporated a little bit. You're going to have um, residue 
in the way and holding onto the soil surface. So you're going to have a soil that's more resistant. On the transport side, you're not going to get as much transport. Why? Because you're hitting all kinds of weird angles. Um, if it does reach the soil surface, um, it's not going to go very far in the raindrop transport. Flow transport again, uh, you've got a lot of more. You've got more infiltration with no-till because you've got the continuous pores getting to the surface more often, and so it's going to be slightly lower. And then flow transport is going to be limited because again, you've got a tortuous path caused by that surface residue. Best example I've had that I've been able to watch was I used to have a demonstration rainfall simulator that I would put a tray of soil out, actually three trays of soil out, and subject them to rainfall. One tray would be bare soil. Another one would be just a few sprinkles of straw on it so that you had a little bit of residue but not too much, and the other one was fully covered with straw. And I would end up at the end of the day with almost no soil left in the one that was bare. Um, if I didn't do anything to it, I would end up with a lot of uh, ups and downs because the residue would protect the soil, but everything around it would disappear on the uh, one that had some straw on it. And on the one that was fully covered, there was hardly anything gone at all, and the water that would come off it was pretty much clear. So uh, it, it gets very obvious when, uh, when this stuff is going on. We do the same thing when we've sealed when we've just seeded something. We'll put a grass mulch on it. Now, some of that is for moisture conservation and keep keeping moisture there so that the uh, grass seed would grow. But to go with it, uh, it's doing a lot of good for the erosion in that it's got high surface cover. You've got a tortuous flow path. Same thing as we have with no-till. Um, and it just causes the sediment or the soil to, to stay put. Um, and you'll actually see some sediment that did get detached and moved a little bit, piling up on the, uh, the mulch uh, because it can't go any further. And it works pretty darn well. And when you compare those two, just a mulch of some kind versus no-till, uh, the attachment is going to tend to be higher with the uh, mulch in front of, uh, say, grass seeding. Why? Because you've been doing a lot of tillage. But on the flip side, you might have some higher on no-till if you're after dry years because here, the variable there is if the crop ahead of it was poor, um, you're not going to get as much residue and that you don't have as much cover. So the detachment varies depending on a lot of things. Transport, probably higher in the mulch situation all the way through um, because you've got a much more disturbed seedbed situation. So unless the mulch was actually cut in with a disc or something, um, you know, the uh, water could flow under it and uh, you still get some erosion, um, but still works pretty darn well. On the sediment control, you want to reduce the transport capacity or you want to enhance the deposition, one way or the other. So if we're going to reduce transport capacity, it's barriers. Okay. You can't have just a wall because it's going to back up behind it. It'll work for a while, and then it'll flow over if the flow keeps going. So what you want is something that's leaky, a porous dam of some kind. Uh, you might see a pile of rock once in a while, for example, that does a pretty good job as long as you don't get a big flow that could actually move the rock, and I've seen that. Um, and then there's silt fence and some other things that are will let water through, but will still slow it down and trap sediment. And then if you can increase infiltration one way or another, that would help too. On enhancing deposition, this is something that gets used a fair bit in sedimentation ponds when you can't do other things. They'll put chemistry in the pond itself. It's called a flocculant, and essentially what it does is it uh, changes the chemistry of the water enough so that the um, chemical or electrical attraction between particles increases a lot and once they're bigger then they go ahead and 
settle out so you can increase the sedimentation rate but it's expensive because you know as water flows through things uh, then that flocculant goes with it so you have to keep putting it in all the time so ideas or questions about erosion principles essentially limit the transport limit the detachment and you're going to limit the erosion it's simple concepts out in practice it's a little bit more complicated Now, and I'm thinking this is about the last set of slides, so we're going to finish up pretty much right on the 90-minute mark. Um, water quality principles. There's really two concepts that I want to make sure you get here, and that's the idea of concentration and the idea of load. Concentrations defined a couple different ways, but the idea is pretty much the same. Uh, the mass of contaminant per mass of material or the mass of contaminant per volume of material. Units, you've seen PPT, PPM, PPB, MG over L, micrograms per liter, nanograms per liter. Okay, We'll talk through some of these here because it's kind of important that you have a concept. So let's start with a concentration of a specific herbicide in your well water. Which one would you like? It's actually a, a, a trick question because units make all the difference. So when I add those units, you've got micrograms per liter. Get the arrow up here. First one is micrograms per liter or parts per billion. We'll talk through that in a minute. Milligrams per liter or parts per million grams per liter or parts per thousand or we could do nanograms per liter which is parts per trillion notice how I did use PPT and I've seen PPT many many times and sometimes it's parts per thousand sometimes it's parts per trillion and there's a lot of zeros difference between those so you need to specify parts per thousand would be used if you're talking about uh, uh, saline salinity concentration so salt um, whereas some of the pesticides especially the nasty ones and the ones in, that are used in very small quantities can be measured in parts per trillion and in fact dioxin for example is one that it has toxicities that are coming in in parts per trillion so you gotta know that unit as well now the important thing is you can only use parts per million and milligrams per liter interchangeably when the liquid is water. If we're talking about air, it's not the same. If we're talking about soil, it's not the same. If we're talking about alcohol as a solvent, it's not the same because the density of all of those is not one. The only material that has a density of one is water. And if it's parts per million parts, so grams per million grams, unless you've got a, a one for a density, the conversion is not there. So if you think about it, remember the density of water is one kilogram per milligram, or excuse me, one kilogram per liter. And here we have one milligram per liter is a part per million. Why is that? Well, if you do it in mass per mass, it would be one milligram per kilogram, because a liter is a kilogram. And there's a million milligrams in a kilogram. That's where the million comes from. So that's why one part per million is the same as one milligram per liter, as long as the density is one. Okay. Now, flow versus concentration. Concentration is the mass of a contaminant in a given volume. Load is the rate of mass movement. So it's equal to the concentration times the flow rate. And when you look at the units there, all of a sudden it goes from 
mass per volume with the concentration and volume per time with the flow rate to mass per time, which is what we're interested in load. What's important depends upon what you're talking about. And I did uh, several years work with a consulting firm here in Champaign that did an awful lot of work for the um, agrochemical crop protection chemistry industry. And if we were looking at a particular compound of interest, if we were talking about um, ecological impact, um, drinking water problems, those kinds of things, it didn't matter what the load was because the regulated quantity is a concentration, the maximum contaminant level of that particular chemistry. So concentration is important too, depending upon what the thing that we're talking about is. If we're talking about a regulation that is based on concentration, the concentration is obviously of interest. If we're talking about trying to predict movement of a material from a field to a organism of interest downstream, now we got to talk about load because that's the way you figure out how it's moving is to know what the rate of movement is. Um, you can't just talk about the concentration. Um, obviously, if you have no flow, uh, the concentration is only important where it exists because it's not moving anywhere. If you've got heavy, heavy flow, lots of water moving, then the mass load may be a very, very small concentration because of the volume of the water we're talking about. So there's there's a lot of trade-off between the two. Uh, when I was working in consulting, the, the one client we had just didn't even want to talk about load. Why? Because everything they were dealing with was measurement of how much of their compound was showing up in a reservoir or a stream or something. And they were talking about the impact on um, the ecosystem, you know, exposure of organisms to a certain concentration. Um, and they weren't concerned with the load because they weren't talking about how it was moving through the system. They were talking about how it was impacting the, the spot where it was. And if it's in a drinking water system, then we're talking about maximum contaminant load uh, per EPA regulations. Um, and that's where really where it comes into play. Um, so concentration is important, but you got to know the units. And load is important if you're trying to look at how it's moving and how it's going to impact downstream. Okay, talked about these just a little bit. Maximum contaminant levels, a concentration above which drinking water treatment systems must treat the water. We're talking about nitrate as measured as nitrogen. That level is 6 milligrams, or excuse me, 10 milligrams per liter. If we're talking about uh, uh, atrazine, um, which is a herbicide, and that one would be 3 parts per billion, so 3 micrograms per liter is the maximum contaminant level. And, and that's under review right now. Um, when we get to maximum, or excuse me, total maximum daily load, it's essentially the concept of this is a contaminant load that a given body of water can meet all of its designated uses while having that load exerted upon it. And essentially, it's the sum of all of the loads from a watershed of a given contaminant, a contaminant be it nitrate, phosphorus, uh, dieldrin, aldrin, whatever, whatever the contaminant of interest is, the maximum uh, daily load is the amount that that water body can handle, um, in, usually in kilograms per day but they could use some other units as well. So that's a big process to come up with that TMDL to be able to um, find all the sources of a given contaminant and calculate what the load from those sources would be delivered to a reservoir or a stream reach or whatever the water body of interest is. And then you can manage it from there because if you figure out that it can only handle 20 as just a number and the sum of the current loads is 30, uh, 
Now you've got to figure out how to get 10 of it knocked out, controlled, so that it doesn't reach that water body. And that's what the implementation plans that go with the TMDL determination is all about. Okay. Questions. This is about anything. And you can use your microphone if you want, but it seems like everybody's pretty shy about that. I've not just gone silent. I noticed Derek was typing. Um, On a particular reference on reading Stokes' uh, law, I'd have to dig. I know I've seen it. Um, it would probably be more in a reference like you would get from uh, Midwest Plan Service or maybe some of the handbooks. Um, I guess I don't have an actual example in mind. Um, I have seen the chart, though. So it would also be something that could be constructed, but I know you can't take anything but bound stuff into the exams. Probably on, on Russell and USLE, I'll cover some of it when I do the, uh, the uh, or excuse me, I'm not covering that. Um, I, if I remember right, um, Dr. Motar had some of that in it when we do, I'm trying to think through the other ones that I'm doing, because um, the hydrology hydraulics is straight that, it's, uh, it's structures and hydrology. The soil and water management stuff, there's really nothing in there as I remember. Russell is a program now, it would be really hard to, to do an exam on it. Um, USLE concepts. It'd be good to review it and have it marked. Um, I think I've got some of it in another lecture. Uh, I'd have to go back and look to make sure because obviously it's been a year since I did them and I've got to rework a couple of them so I'll know for sure here in a bit. But um, the USLE has gone so much, or the Russell side has gone so much toward a computer program that I'm not sure it can be on the exam other than concepts. Um, the equation itself is pretty straightforward. We could go through that and I'll take a look and make sure that it's covered one way or another or check with Rubia to see if he's doing it. Um, and, and of course since I'm teaching a review webinar I cannot sit in on the uh, exam writing sessions. So I really don't know what they're thinking about putting on it. Some more typing going on. That's why I'm pausing. Okay, um, probably something you could be called upon to uh, calculate or, or tell them uh, literally what size particle would, could settle out in, uh, in a um, sediment trap that is a certain length and you've got water flowing across it at a certain velocity. What you'd be doing then is calculating a time and a depth and essentially telling them that you know if it's a one foot deep, then they'd have to specify some of that stuff. But using something like Stokes' Law to, to give them a size of sediment that could be trapped by a given um, trap. Um, another one would be um, to just think, get my head around it for a second. See, the thing about these questions, they have to design them 
so that in the period of time you've got available, you can answer the questions. So they can't give you a question that's going to take 30 minutes to solve. It's got to be a you know, six-minute question or less. Be able to do 80 uh, questions in the time that you get. So uh, they've got to be pretty concise. And that's I'm trying to give you an example. Well, actually, the, uh, the example I gave you with the, uh, with the size pump, pretty much any of the examples I used were simple enough that they could be a an exam question. So if we you know the the one with the pump where I used Bernoulli's to you know say what capacity and at what pressure a pump would have to be. And then they're going to give you examples of uh, of that answer of flow rate and the pressure kind of thing. Um, same way with uh, any of those I think you could see you could you could pull a question out of it with any of the examples I gave you. With the fundamentals like this, it's a little bit tougher. Um, they've got to be very, very specified. When you get into the, uh, the other two, you could definitely pull pieces out of the examples and you'd be able to uh, make sure you can put an exam question together that you'd be able to solve in a reasonable amount of time that really shows that you know what you're doing. No problem. Any other questions? I'll hang out for a while. If you've got questions, um, we can go ahead and handle them. Uh, other than that, that's that's the presentation for tonight. Um, let me kick back to the beginning. Go toward the other way. Nope. If you have questions, I'm to do this. Um, that email works just great, and uh, you know I can I can answer questions that way too. So you might want to jot that down. Um, with that, if you're ready, uh, you can go ahead and sign off, and uh, my Next one, so you know what's going on, let me just look at my calendar quick, remind myself. The next one is February 9th, and that one will be on hydrology and hydraulics. And the one after that is on March 1st, and that one will be on soil and water management. So we'll see you later on then. Thanks for attending tonight.